Yeah, in the last three lectures, we have been looking at uh, the issue of uh, magneto resistance and any material which loses its uh, resistance uh, in the presence or absence of magnetic field becomes very interesting. Uh, in the first example, we looked at rare earth manganites which actually has a genie inside the lattice. The magnetism controls the electrical conductivity and as a result there is a huge drop in resistance when you try to disturb the magnetic ordering there. And um, in the next example, we saw it need not be a ferromagnetic material uh, in bulk, but if you can make stacked layers of ferromagnet an anti ferromagnet or ferromagnet and um, a spacer layer then you would expect a colossal change in the resistance. So, uh, we looked at few examples of this uh, metallic multi layers. We are uh, actually looking into the theme of uh, the various aspects of magneto resistance. We call it GMR, we call it uh, TMR, CMR. GMR and TMR are predominantly uh, involving metallic ferromagnetic layers whereas, CMR is confined more to oxides. Uh, so, we looked at the example of uh, CMR, we looked at example of uh, uh, multi layers of GMR and uh, we looked a little bit into the mechanism of uh, TMR uh, which brings about a colossal change in resistance. Uh, <clears throat> just to uh, give you a recap of what is the central issue, the issue is to make use of the electron spin. Electron has a down spin and electron has a up spin, therefore, you can try to exploit the orientation of this uh, electron spin up or spin down and you can try to moderate the electrical conductivity. <coughs> uh, in the bulk, uh, there are ferromagnetic materials. Uh, as you know, paramagnetic material is best exemplified uh, in this uh, fashion. When magnetic field is removed, the moments are oriented uh, in random way, whereas uh, if when they are uh, aligned, um, when applied uh, magnetic field is stronger and it can um, reorient all this in one direction. So, this is the situation of a paramagnet and then we also looked at a typical ferromagnet. A typical ferromagnet gets ordered uh, below T c, they are ordered like this and uh, above T c they get uh, reoriented into a paramagnetic phase. Now, uh, the point is uh, the presence of magnetic field produces only anisotropic magneto resistance and the order of such change in resistance is very very small. As a result, you cannot bring about a colossal change in resistance when you are looking at uh, uh, anisotropic magneto resistance. Therefore, you need to use the same ferromagnetic material, but you should align it in different way. You should stack it in different way, then you can induce a colossal drop in magneto resistance. Uh, so far, we have seen the many phases of magneto resistance we call this as GMR, we call this as TMR and we call this as CMR. A GMR predominantly we are talking about metallic multilayers and organic inorganic multilayers. In TMR we looked at metal insulator, metal trilayers and the CMR predominantly rare earth manganites and ruthenates. Today I am going to spend little bit more time on this issue of organic inorganic multilayers and why it is advantageous why we need to go for such a, a combination of organic inorganic multi layers. <coughs> now, just to uh, bring back uh, to focus the two uh, important uh, mechanisms that governs, we said if there is a ferromagnet here which is aligned in this direction, ferromagnet here which is aligned in this direction and it is separated by a non magnet of this dimension, then you have two different uh, uh, resistance uh, pathway. One is if the up spin uh, electron is going from here to here, then you have a, a resistance pathway in this form and uh, if you have a down spin, then you have a resistance pathway in this form. So, uh, if you are if it is in an anti parallel direction, your ferromagnets are anti parallelly aligned, 
then you have a different pathway uh, for uh, resistance and this is the model that we propose. So, uh, overall if, uh, if you have an anti parallel situation then you have larger resistance and if you apply a magnetic field you have a smaller resistance specially uh, via this form which we call it a short circuit therefore, you can see a change in the uh, magneto resistance. This is mostly a spin dependent scattering which happens across the interface. The other one we also told about um, <coughs> the mechanism of uh, tunneling magneto resistance. In the aligned case you actually have the uh, spin up electrons going from here to here when they are aligned uh, parallelly and in that case the spin sub bands both are same whereas, when it is uh, aligned in anti ferromagnetic fashion the spin up band is located here whereas, in this case spin up band is located here therefore, there is a reluctance for this electron to go here and therefore, this uh, <coughs> resistance is going to be uh, greater in the anti parallel way. So, these are two important considerations uh, for the resistance uh, across uh, multi layers. Another uh, example that we can think of is instead of a insulator a non magnetic insulator you can try to replace that with a ferromagnetic insulator. What would happen? if there is a ferromagnetic insulator then electron when it goes from here to here if suppose it is up spin and then it has to retain its spin memory when it goes to this layer and in that case if there is a ferromagnetic uh, uh, ordering or if there is a ferromagnetic uh, alignment in this insulating phase then the spin up can have the this electron can have a spin memory which can be retained as it goes to this layer. So, this is also a useful concept instead of using a non magnetic insulator you can go for a ferromagnetic insulator to maintain the spin memory as the electron goes from one electrode to the other electrode. So, in that case what is the situation um, <coughs> this red uh, m h loop m versus h loop what you see here corresponds to nickel ferrite. NFO is nothing but Ni Fe 2 O 4 which is a spinal uh, <coughs> spinal ferrite and this is a ferromagnetic um, uh, and this is a insulator typically it gives a um, magnetic hysteresis loop of this fashion and you also have the hysteresis loop of the unsintered ion layer which is having a rather uh, different coercivity compared to the bottom layer which is actually grown at uh, 250 degree C. So, you have essentially same thickness of iron, but with different coercivity because in one case you grew the film at 250 therefore, the coercivity changes and in the other case you have iron which is deposited at room temperature therefore, it has a different coercivity. So, you have two different coercive ferromagnetic electrodes and separated by a ferromagnetic insulator typically you would see the device showing the m versus h loop in this form. So, what is uh, uh, unique about this you have this staircase uh, you have this staircase type of uh, hysteresis loop which is typical for a device. So, if a device is performing then you have the staircase uh, sort of uh, uh, feature and then the magneto resistance also shows a pronounced activity. You can see although the order of uh, percentage MR is rather low, but you can clearly see this butterfly shape uh, butterfly wing shaped MR uh, curve which clearly shows that uh, this sort of um, <coughs> magneto resistive feature can be accomplished with uh, a ferromagnetic insulator. So, this is another example one can think of you can make this device in this fashion you first put the ion electrode and then this is your NFO layer and then you put another stripe of uh, uh, Fe then you can measure um, the voltage that develops uh, across this interface. So, this is one example where we can show that you can use variety of uh, 
uh, spacer layers not just a non magnetic layer you can use MGO we have already seen one example of MGO which is neither magnetic nor it is uh, metallic, but it is uh, from uh, it is a anti ferromagnetic insulator and uh, this is also showing a pronounced uh, tunneling magneto resistance. Now, uh, GMR can also be seen in granular systems. Uh, what is a granular system? Uh, for example, if you take a cobalt silver, these two are not miscible. In other words, we can say they are immiscible, they are immiscible alloys. So, if you actually deposit uh, say uh, silver layer and then you try to put cobalt layer, it would not grow as a silver layer and then as a two dimensional cobalt layer. What would happen because of the immiscibility all the uh, cobalt will actually form clusters, they will form clusters of uh, cobalt uh, atoms and it will be deposited on the silver matrix. Now, the interaction between these clusters will uh, determine what sort of magneto resistance that you can get and this is also called as granular system. Uh, one drawback about the granular system is the field sensitivity is less, we can also achieve that using iron and silver. Now, um, you can make several such composites, uh, for example, uh, one can run through nickel ferrite uh, PPY, this is an example of how this um, GMR can be seen even in bulk, because your NF NFO is nothing but uh, ferromagnetic insulator, you can try to provide the conducting pathway by coating it intimately with the uh, uh, polypropylene so, uh, or polypyrrole. So, in this case you take pyrrole and you try to polymerize it in situ with the suspended nickel ferrite. So, as pyrrole is getting um, polymerized, you will see that this nickel ferrite particles are coated intimately by uh, pyrrole, uh, polypyrrole as a result you get a, a conducting matrix like this. So, the moments are actually aligned randomly and uh, you have the polypyrrole matrix which is actually holding all this nickel ferrite um, clusters. Uh, now, this uh, can give us some clue whether we can achieve magneto resistance in this sort of bulk composites, because so far we have seen uh, whether uh, there is pronounced uh, MR in uh, metallic multi layers. Now, we can also see whether there is any faint chance of harvesting a large percentage magneto resistance in bulk composites. Uh, if you actually take a look at the infrared spectra and the X-ray diffraction spectra, you would find it is very interesting that uh, the pure NFO uh, that is nickel ferrite gives a typical spinal pattern, whereas where the PPY which is a polymer gives you amorphous pattern. Now, if you keep loading nickel ferrite in uh, PPY to the order of 50 percent, 70 percent or 90 percent in spite of uh, loading that much of nickel ferrite even with little percentage of PPY you can see still the faint amorphous pattern dominates over the crystalline nickel ferrite. What it suggests that nickel ferrite can be intimately coated by polypyrrole as a result you can try to measure the magneto resistance in bulk in such composites. Uh, the infrared uh, spectra also gives you clue about the uh, about this particular band which is propping up with the increasing NFO because this is a characteristic uh, uh, nickel oxygen bond which can be seen uh, in this uh, NFO PPY matrix. So, one can actually make uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, composite materials with the wide range of uh, uh, loading capacity and one can see whether this also gives pronounced GMR. If you actually take polypropylene itself which is a metallic um, uh, polymer, uh, you would see that uh, there is a positive magneto resistance and it is of the order of uh, um, uh, less than 1 uh, percent although, but uh, it shows uh, a more significant uh, MR at 80 k. But what we find here 
for an optimum composition of 50 percent NFO which is uh, NFO PPY uh, composite we see MR is much more higher than the even the 90 percent. So, there seems to be some influence of the NFO loading um, on uh, polypyrrole and uh, there seems to be some way that we can look for uh, magneto resistance even in this bulk composites although the magnitude is less. We can also look at the other granular uh, <coughs> system that is cobalt uh, silver uh, again in this case you have the iron or cobalt silvers which is dispersed in the um, silver matrix and we can achieve this sort of uh, cobalt silver uh, alloys by using sodium borohydride as the reducing agent and this is the overall uh, reaction um, as to what happens sodium borohydride reacts with the metal salts and it uh, um, releases uh, metal and uh, boric acid and all this uh, can be easily removed filtered therefore, essentially you get a pure uh, metal. If you are going to take uh, two metals uh, M n and M prime n plus then you can actually get a alloy and this alloy uh, can be nano in size as I told you if it is a granular MR the feature is uh, something similar to this where uh, you have uh, the saturation uh, uh, value is rather high because the switching phenomena of this randomly oriented moments takes larger field as a result you have a very low saturation uh, effect. Uh, nevertheless, we can see for a um, <coughs> 60 percent cobalt doped silver uh, alloy in other words uh, 60 40 alloy we can say um, you see a, a very nice trend of a metallic behavior down to 4 Kelvin. And, uh, we have tried to measure the uh, magnetic property or the uh, T c for this alloy and this is reported to be above 350 Kelvin. Because of the um, measuring constraints one cannot measure magneto resistance beyond uh, 350. So, for this reason we have tried to measure the M r at 350 and we see that uh, uh, near to T c this sort of granular alloys show a pronounced effect of up to 20 percent MR um, in this bulk <coughs> cobalt silver composites. This is uh, new because uh, we, uh, there, are, there are no reports where cobalt silver alloy is known to show such high uh, values. It is possible from this work that one can try to prepare by either sputtering or other methods to prepare cobalt silver films and try to look at the T c close to uh, sorry uh, M r close to the T c. <coughs> we can also try to do this with the uh, iron silver compo uh, alloy composites where you see again a clear meta uh, uh, metallic behavior down to uh, 4 Kelvin and one can see that uh, uh, with increasing uh, temperature the resistance uh, increases and uh, MR shows a very clear feature although the MR percentage is uh, uh, significantly low, but it is showing higher proportion at uh, 5 K compared to 300 K. So, you have another uh, composition iron silver 50 50 um, alloy which also shows a similar trend where uh, uh, you, you, you see lesser MR percentage at uh, room temperature compared to 5 Kelvin and uh, this can be engineered for applications if we can translate this uh, composites into thin films. So, I have shown you a variety of uh, uh, combinations of alloys which show MR behavior. Just to sum up um, at this stage uh, what I have shown to you is that um, this stacking of multi layers is very important and one can try to engineer a variety of uh, combinations uh, as spacer layers and uh, we can try to observe uh, significant MR in cases of uh, metallic multi layers and there is lot more work to be done uh, for, <coughs> for spacer layers which are not traditionally metallic. 
Um, so, we will go to another important issue of uh, organic multilayers. Um, we can start from the origin where exactly this idea stems from. Uh, this is uh, known as a um, predominant feature in organic light emitting diodes. In organic light emitting diodes, we have almost all the layers which are um, organic, but for the anode and the cathode. So, why this organics can be uh, brought into spintronics? What is the need and what are the advantages over the metallic multilayers is the question. Now, spin based electronics as you know, we can try to read the information of uh, each of this uh, domains. Uh, if we can uh, look at the spin orientation, so depending on the spin orientation, you can have a binary information storage that has non volatility, it can have high integration density and fast switching time and low power consumption. All these are advantages for spin based electronics, which are obviously um, absent or uh, incurs costly penalties when you think of the regular semiconducting industry. So, uh, for this reason we need to uh, look at new possible avenues where we can try to uh, look for wider applications involving organic spintronics. Now, why spins in organics? There are two perturbing factors of spin ori orientation in bulk. Uh, number one, uh, you have spin orbit interaction. Uh, in this case, interaction between electron spin and nuclear charge are becoming important and this is uh, more pronounced for heavier atoms. The spin orbit interaction is more pronounced for um, heavier atoms and then you also have another competing interaction which is hyperfine interaction. This interaction is between the electron spin and the nuclear spin. So, you have two issues that you confront in the uh, multilayer systems, especially when you think of uh, spintronics. One is electron spin interacting with nuclear charge, another one electron spin competing with the nuclear spin. As a result, um, you have the spintronic uh, values or the magneto resistance values are considerably low, especially when you involve uh, heavier atoms, because the spin orbit coupling contribution is of the order of z to the power 4, z is the nuclear charge. As a result, um, since this is dependent on uh, z power 4, uh, the uh, contribution of spin orbit coupling is usually dominating and that is why we should try to see whether we can completely ignore this contribution, so that you can maximize on the uh, GMR or the magneto resistance ratio. There comes the issue uh, of organic molecules. If I need to subdue this uh, both these effects, then I should look for organic molecules which are lighter atoms and they are better alternatives, because you can minimize both on spin orbit coupling and hyperfine interaction to a larger level. As a result, there is a search for new compounds. Now, where does organic come into picture in electronics? The classic example is that of organic LED, because in the year 1987, it was Vanslick and Tang who actually reported organic electroluminescent devices, which appeared in uh, applied physics letters. And a typical organic uh, LED configuration is like this, you have the um, transparent ITO, which uh, is compounded with P dot PSS, um, which is a hole doping um, uh, layer. And then you also have aluminum as cathode with a small barrier lithium fluoride. Now, if this, uh, this is sandwiching a organic semiconductor, then light comes out of the ITO layer, which brings about a new generation of display devices. These are all the older uh, devices, which are uh, presently coming into market. You can bring down the um, screen uh, size, uh, because you can go for large area and also you can minimize on the deposition intricacies. So, 
uh, organic semiconductors brings about a new generation of uh, uh, devices which involves uh, spin 2. Now, spins in organics uh, is uh, construed uh, in this way. Uh, what is the mechanism of this uh, organic LED? Uh, as you see here, electrons come from the anode and then um, holes go from the cathode and they do combine here. Uh, when they combine, first they are held by a coulombically bound electron hole pair and this value 1 3 specially refers to one sp spin singlet and three spin triplets both in electron hole pairs and they together combine as excitons. So, as a um, electron hole pair the proportion is one uh, spin singlet and three uh, spin triplets. Now, they together combine to form a exciton with a singlet uh, proportion and a triplet uh, um, nature. So, you can actually have the singlet exciton and the triplet exciton of which the um, excitonic spin singlets are the ones which radiate the fluorescent light. In other words, if you look at the spin statistics, you have um, 25 percent or one fourth of the possibility is the singlet exciton and three fourth of the possibility is the triplet exciton. And because of spin uh, rule, spin selection rule, only the uh, singlet um, excitons are allowed to um, radiate and therefore, they account for the light that you see in an organic LED. In other words, uh, of the um, of the excitons that are produced due to electron hole combination, you have only 25 percent which is responsible for the light emission and uh, 75 percent is spin forbidden. There are ways to harvest this, if you can annihilate this uh, triplets, then you can convert this into singlet pair and thereby you can increase the efficiency of this singlet uh, excitons which radiate fluorescent light. Uh, <coughs> so, this is what I said, the singlet which is responsible for the fluorescence and uh, the triplet uh, excitons which are responsible for the phosphorescence this is the theoretical limit and uh, the experimental observations are slightly higher than 25 percent in various cases. Now, these are some of the organic molecules which are used in uh, the current OLED devices and mostly these are all polymers uh, PPV, PFO, uh, MEH, PPV and uh, P3H and so on. Now, how do how can we translate this spin LED into a spin magneto resistive device? If you carefully look at this configuration, this is your OLED device and if you want to convert it into a spin valve, all you need to do is replace this anode uh, uh, cathode and anode by ferromagnetic electrodes. So, if you replace ITO with a ferromagnetic electrode if you replace aluminum with a ferromagnetic electrode, then you are essentially making a spin valve device which involves a organic layer. This ferromagnetic electrode can be a, a metal a inorganic metal or such as say iron or it can be cobalt. So, essentially you are making a, a, a iron or organic iron electrode or device where you can look for uh, the spin valve operation and this is typically the way we can cartoonize the uh, spin valve structure that involves a organic where you have a ferromagnet uh, 1 and ferromagnet 2 this is the organic layer and as you see that when the when the uh, ferromagnets are aligned then there is more of uh, electron uh, mobility as a result you have a current high situation uh, when the spin valve is open. Now, if they are anti parallelly aligned then you have current low and therefore, even with the, this sort of a configuration um, I ferromagnet organic layer ferromagnet device you can essentially bring about a spin valve response using organic. 
and this is the way that a spin wall will work. If you have uh, this sort of a configuration then you will uh, see a sharp uh, rise in the resistance as a result you can imitate this to be like a inorganic spin wall. <coughs> so, in organic spin wall what are the examples? Uh, Park actually reported this uh, uh, first work where he used LSMO and cobalt as the ferromagnetic electrodes. Uh, one of the reason why um, LSMO which is lanthanum strontium mangane manganese oxide which is used is because this is known to be a 100 percent spin polarized half metal and therefore, we can use this as a bottom electrode and the interface also can by and large can be mo moderated if you if you are going to put a organic layer. P 3 H T is nothing but uh, a thiophene moiety with substitutions and this is a good whole transport layer as a result we can try to have this um, <coughs> in between uh, two ferromagnetic electrodes and uh, the cobalt can be used as a top electrode which is reported by uh, Majumdar and co-workers and they have reported this in 2006. So, this is a typical configuration of a um, organic spin wall where you are essentially using ferromagnetic electrodes and uh, your middle uh, layer uh, is your organic. But what are the problems here? Problems in making this is to do with the interface because to grow a organic and a inorganic interface it is very very difficult because this organic layer should be good enough to wet the inorganic layer or the inorganic layer has to be atomically fla flat so that you can make a very thin uh, two dimensional layer of your organic which is the challenge. Otherwise many such structures could have been realized by now. Uh, so far the limitation is you cannot grow a good interface here because of the roughness that is coming from the inorganic layer and because of the growth mode which can vary for the organic layer. Nevertheless you for the for the device that we saw which involves cobalt um, P3, P3 HT um, LSMO layer you can see here the magneto resistance at 300 k and magneto resistance at 5 k it is sufficiently uh, remarkable uh, responses there. In this case you can see at 5 k a very large response and uh, in the other case you see a faint response of about 3 percent at 3 uh, 300 k which is not uh, a bad number considering the uh, metallic multi layers at room temperature definitely there is a good response for this uh, device. Uh, spin injection and spin transport and spin detection uh, seem seemingly are proved in this uh, organic electronic device. These are small but distinct signature at room temperature therefore, spin polarized transport through organic multi uh, materials is therefore, possible. <coughs> So, what is this uh, organic uh, magneto resistance which can be called as OMR uh, organic multi layers uh, first uh, even before a typical organic spin wall was done uh, a typical uh, OLED device was taken and magnet was kept in closer proximity and this is the response that you would see a huge change in the resistance uh, with the uh, driving voltage is um, realized uh, when you have a PFO as uh, the organic layer and therefore, uh, a typical OLED device can also give you a large magneto resistance. It need not necessarily involve a ferromagnet organic ferromagnet uh, tri layers even a typical organic LED can give you large room temperature response. Uh, because of the uh, spin statistics that are involved in such um, <coughs> phenomena. Uh, using this as uh, a clue um, towards printed magnetic uh, sensors based on organic diodes um, Majumdar group have come out with another structure which involves silver, aluminum and P3HT 
and put it between the magnets and then you can see a clear MR behavior uh, that can be uh, that can be seen. This gives us um, the challenge to go for uh, printed electronics which is another good development in this field using organic layers. So, one can go for uh, different models and how do we understand uh, the organic uh, magneto resistance. Uh, there are several uh, issues that are being addressed one is the bipolar ionic uh, uh, issue then the charge pair issues and uh, also the spin spin interactions all these are discussed in different uh, uh, examples which are quoted uh, in the recent past. Uh, we I would like to leave with the one more example on organic insulator. Uh, we can take two ferromagnetic layers and we can put a spacer and uh, uh, this spacer can be a non magnetic insulator which is a organic uh, layer and uh, what would happen in such situation. Uh, we can try to make this sort of organic layers using pulse electron deposition which is a rugged uh, uh, facility and this is a typical uh, pulse electron deposition chamber which has a facility for a 6 target car carousel and uh, uh, you can use this uh, pulse electron beam to ablate the material from the target and typically during a uh, ablation uh, protocol you would see the plasma that is coming out because you can um, you can essentially use this pulse uh, beam for any type of material not only metallic, but you can may use uh, organic material you can use insulating material to ablate this uh, sort of uh, compounds and uh, this is the uh, overall setup uh, while in use. Um, so, we can see some examples as to how we can uh, look for magneto resistance um, using organic layers in the next slide. Uh, so, uh, this is a very good facility for making uh, organic trilayers mainly because uh, the insulating organic material can easily be ablated. This is uh, very different compared to uh, pulse laser deposition. Pulse laser deposition is a technique where laser plume laser uh, light falls on the target something like this and then it ablates the material, but if the material is insulating and uh, it has a wide band gap then it is difficult for the um, <coughs> laser light to be absorbed by the material and ablation will be remarkably low. So, for this reason you can replace that with the electron beam then you can try to ablate any material either metallic or insulating material. So, you can make uh, any device uh, uh, applications and this is typically for the compound PTFE which is commercially known as Teflon. Teflon is a good uh, insulator and we can use Teflon as a organic layer between two ferromagnetic electrodes and typically if you have the uh, PTFE uh, deposited using PED you can see the thickness profile and uh, this thickness profile is uh, evaluated uh, from uh, a profile of meter and uh, you can actually go up to uh, 21 uh, 22 nanometers 22 nanometer thick PTFE layer can be deposited and this is how you can look at your thickness uh, profile. One can also go down up to 5 nanometer comfortably with a continuous uh, uh, deposition of this film in two dimensional way. So, after ensuring that it is possible for us to make a device structure of this configuration iron PTFE iron trilayer and uh, how do you go about it first you put a iron stripe like this and then we can put uh, the organic uh, uh, layer and then you can put one more uh, metallic layer on the top and you can measure across the uh, electrodes and then 
Um, you can also see the uh, AFM images of the um, iron layer which is deposited as a bottom electrode. This is actually deposited at 200 degree C and then you can put a 6 nanometer uh, thick PTFE film the surface looks like this and then the top layer which is actually deposited at room temperature shows a much larger grain size compared to smaller grain size for iron electrode. <coughs> now how does the um, device respond if you individually take the top and the bottom electrodes uh, iron electrodes you can see the coercivity is different because when you deposit the uh, iron at a 200 degree C or so then the coercivity shrinks whereas the top layer shows uh, higher coercivity uh, which is deposited at room temperature and uh, uh, this is the typical signature for the device. When device is there then you would see this uh, two step hysteresis loop which is showing the clear uh, device operation. Now you can vary the thickness we can go down to 2 nanometer, 4 nanometer, 3 nanometer and 6 nanometer and as you increase the uh, PTFE thickness you can see that this step is more resolved compared to smaller one uh, thicknesses. Uh, now the question is when you can achieve such uh, uh, small thickness of this PTF layers whether the device can clearly show magneto resistance is the question you would see that in the next slide. When you have 3 nanometer and 4 nanometer although you have this um, two step hysteresis loop which is characteristic of a device but when you look at the magneto resistance they are essentially showing negative magneto resistance negative MR which means the top ion layer is actually getting coupled with the bottom ion layer only then you will see a negative magneto resistance. But if they are clearly separated by PTFE layer then you should actually see positive magneto resistance which is nothing but the response for tunneling magneto resistance device. So, what does that mean even though you have a two step magnetic hysteresis there is shorting between shorting between the bottom and the top ion electrodes it is short circuiting as a result we can say that the, this layer is not flat or it is not fully covered there are pinholes there are pinholes in this layer which is actually bringing about a, a short circuit between the top and the bottom electrode. So, what do you do if you go further to 6 nanometer if you go to 6 nanometer then you see this response is much clearer and if you look at the magneto resistance compared to the previous one in previous one it is a inverted response whereas when you go to higher thickness you see that the response is now positive. So what does that mean at a critical thickness of say 6 nanometer you are able to clearly demonstrate a tunneling magneto resistance behavior as a result you see a positive MR although the value is very less still it is appreciable to show that organic spintronic can be demonstrated. Now what is the clue for uh, whether this device is working if you look at the uh, resistance value for such a device you can see uh, in the presence and absence of field the resistance is varying and the value of resistance gives you a clue as to whether such a device is working. Suppose the top electrode and the bottom electrode are short circuiting then the value of this resistance will be less than uh, 5 ohms or this may be in milli ohms because it is essentially coming from ion electrode. 
the fact that you are seeing a very high resistance it means the organic layer is able to decouple the resist uh, the bottom electrode from the top electrode as a result you see a pronounced TMR value. So, this is another example that uh, we can look more positively into making organic spin wall or organic uh, TMR uh, junctions which can give you pronounced GMR behavior. There are a lot more things one has to do uh, especially in understanding how the inorganic organic surfaces uh, work. Uh, just to conclude what we have seen so far spin and spintronics will pave way for future electronics number one and organics in spintronics is a fundamentally logical and plausible goal provided you have ways and means to deposit this organic films in a very sequential way and spin polarized transport in organic is now proved even at room temperature if you can carefully look for a suitable combinations then you can achieve maximum spin polarized transport via organic layers and we can also say organic magneto resistance phenomenon opens possibilities uh, for new application of this uh, existing technology. So, we have actually in essence seen different uh, phases of uh, MR phases of MR one we saw about a GMR which is in stacked multi layers and then we saw some examples of tunneling magneto resistance in tri layers. We have seen some example of granular MR in bulk composites and we have also seen organic uh, GMR where we are bringing uh, the hyperfine interactions and the spin orbit uh, coupling interactions into focus and we have tried to see whether organic uh, spintronics can become a vital tool to address to the issue of uh, <coughs> magnetic storage. So, with this I will stop and we will continue with other examples of uh, electronic electrical conductivity in inorganic materials in the next lecture.